So we've, we've learned in, in a relatively short time a great deal about COVID-19 um, and how it differs from the flu. Um, you know, I think that a lot of what we hear is, is initially, at least, that this was a disease of the elderly, uh, but that's actually not true at all. Uh, COVID-19 um, really is everywhere, um, number one, and it afflicts all ages with maybe the exception of, of children. So it seems that uh, kids who were um, below the age of 13, 14 years old um, tend not to at least manifest the disease symptomatically. There are some exceptions, but they're extremely rare. Uh, generally speaking, uh, children, while they may harbor the disease, they may get sick, um, they're not symptomatic. So they don't, they don't experience the same things that we do as adults. Um, it, but it certainly is not a disease of the elderly. It afflicts um, all other ages above uh, 14. Um, it, is, it is kind of was initially thought to be a disease of the elderly because uh, some of the elderly don't do particularly well. The two groups of patients that we see that struggle with this, uh, believe it or not, are first of all men. Uh, and they're men in two age groups, one between 50 and 70, and, and, and then uh, all patients are over the age of 70. Um, so it is, it is different um, from the flu in that it is very communicable. It's very easy to transmit. Um, and it, it does, as I said, um, afflict uh, everybody over the age of 14. So kids, thankfully, are, are, are really um, spared uh, some of the major morbidity um, that uh, COVID-19 um, tends to have on, on the older populations. Um, the, the real finding that's important here um, is that the outcomes seem to be worse in patients with comorbidities. And what that means is uh, in, in a recent study out of the New England Journal, 50% uh, of the patients that really, 48% of the patients that really got very sick and didn't do well um, had diabetes. Um, there's a percentage of them, about a quarter of them that have other comorbidities um, like uh, heart disease or, or pre-existing pulmonary conditions. And so it's really important, um, while on the one hand, to understand um, that having a pre-existing condition like diabetes or, or heart disease or pulmonary disease is problematic. What you really need to understand, and, and, and kind of the, one of the most important take-home messages, is that 80% of patients um, who are infected with COVID-19 will have very mild symptoms, um, or they may even be asymptomatic. And we're seeing now, as we're testing much more frequently, uh, that a good number of patients, somewhere in the 30% range, um, will come in and have absolutely no idea that they're COVID positive uh, and will test them. And lo and behold, we'll find out that they actually have the infection. I think that you, you have to remember the, the main reason to, to do this work and speak to you today is really around trying to decrease the anxiety uh, because there's a lot of unknowns about this. There's a lot of anxiety. There isn't a TV show, a, a news channel that you turn on and don't hear uh, about this pandemic. And, and unfortunately, you hear a lot about the mortality. In fact, things are getting much better. Patients are doing, doing much better, and we're, we're starting to see hopefully a turnaround. And so there's a lot to be happy about. One of the anxieties that people have is that COVID-19 um, is some lurking virus that comes through the grates in a, in a subway uh, uh, station or, or uh, you know, is going to come through your window uh, at night when you're sleeping. And that's just not the case. Um, the reality is, as far and away, the most common transmission is hand to mouth. Um, and so we actually can have control over this. And you shouldn't feel victimized by COVID-19. You can control whether or not you contract it for the most part. And so the key things that I tell people is that you've got to keep your hands clean. You've got to keep your hands away from your face and your neck and your head. And in fact, I tell people, think about all the surfaces that you touch each day as wet paint. And if you touch that wet paint, you need to clean your hands, whether that's with soap and water or Purell. You open up a door, you push an elevator button, um, you pick up a pen that somebody else has been using, you wash your hands right after you're done. And so the transmission is largely through what we call hand to mouth. Um, and so keeping those hands below the shoulders, 
um, and keeping your hands clean are, are probably two of the most important ways um, that you can prevent contracting COVID-19. Um, I'll say a brief uh, comment about the fact that um, mask wearing, it's not so much that um, you're going to prevent getting this disease by wearing a mask. The mask that, that you're, you're being told to wear, whether it's a bandana um, or, or a mask that you might have at home, is for two reasons. One, it reminds you to keep your hands off your face, and that's the most important reason. The second, and maybe little less important reason, is that if you are ill with COVID-19, and you may not even know that you are, you will decrease the amount of virus that you admit in speaking, coughing, sneezing, that kind of thing. And so you're actually protecting others. You're not so much protecting yourself other than it reminding yourself to keep your hands off your face. So there's not a lot of clear data on this. We have to assume that if children can get ill, uh, if they can contract the, this virus, which we believe that they can, just because they don't manifest uh, the disease doesn't mean that they're not carriers. And that in turn means that doesn't necessarily mean that they couldn't give an adult um, COVID-19. So why do, we, why do we say this and why is it important? Number one, um, children could be carriers. They could be ill, you know, at least infected, but not be symptomatically ill. And so we want to use the same social distancing um, rules that we use for adults with children. We, we, we want them to wash their hands. We want them to keep their hands away from their face. Um, we don't want them, uh, you know, traveling around or in school in big groups. Um, because they'll infect each other. And while they may not manifest the disease the way we would, they certainly can come home and, and bring it back to mom and dad and the family. So it's really important to understand um, where they fit into this. Yeah, so it, it, the fact is, and, and this goes back to understanding the virus um, so that you can feel in control, so you feel empowered, you don't feel victimized. Um, a lot of people point to the healthcare workers um, and so many doctors and nurses that got sick early on. The reality was is most of those physicians um, became ill before it was realized that this was so prevalent in the community. And so they weren't wearing the proper protection equipment, the mask or the goggles. They were seeing patients in the office, they were seeing patients in the hospital um, or in, even in the ICU, and they weren't properly dressed. Um, and so you, you have this delay from exposure to then manifestation of the, of the illness. And um, I think a lot of these healthcare workers, physicians, surgeons, and nurses were exposed in, early on when patients were still asymptomatic and then manifested the disease. Um, now we know uh, working in the ICUs, um, as we all do working in the operating rooms, that when you're probably properly dressed and you have the mask and eye covering, um, and you wash your hands, um, the transmission rate is much, much less. In fact, it's far less. So, so you do have control over this, and you shouldn't feel victimized. Um, even physicians, and we're working in this environment every day, uh, if we follow the same rules that we're talking about for the public, uh, it keeps us safe. Yeah, so the idea of taking supplements to boost the immunity or supplements or protective, you know, there's no evidence that, that that's effective here. And, and it shouldn't be uh, considered as a way to protect yourself so that way you don't have to practice some of the measures we talked about, like uh, social distancing or hand washing. There is no evidence that taking vitamin C or any other supplement um, is going to prevent you from contracting uh, this illness. Yeah, so um, you have to remember that whenever you talk about taking any drug, um, whether it's Plaquenil here or hydro hydroxychloroquine um, or uh, azithromycin, which is an antibiotic that's often paired with hydroxychloroquine, um, there are always risks of taking these. In particular, the risk of, of these two drugs, particularly together, is that it can cause changes in your heart rhythm and in your EKG strip that can be very, very dangerous. And so while these are given on trials, uh, particularly in hospitals. Um, it's not the kind of thing you would want to take at home and not have a monitored EKG uh, because it can be very, very dangerous. Uh, and as a result, it's discouraged. That along with the fact that the data is not clear that it helps. And so you may be putting yourself at risk without the reward that you would hope to get. Um, I think we're going to have much more information in the coming uh, weeks um, there's some very exciting trials using hydroxychloroquine, using some of these retrovirals uh, in combination uh, with antibiotics. 
Uh, and so there's a series of trials that were turned out very, very quickly. Um, and they're going to they're going to yield some important data for us to come. But I'd be very careful about hanging my hat on the uh, on the Plaquenil um, hook until we have real data. Yeah. So you know, look, there. One of the things that has happened is because of this pandemic and the just the expanse of it and the impact of it is that um, we can't forget that we have a lot of other patients who are ill. Some of them do have cancer. Some of them just have. Uh, real difficult uh, to control diabetes, hypertension, the list goes on and on. Um, and we can't neglect that patient group because we, we, we owe it to them to take care of them. But here's what I would say. Right now, we're in a, a peak phase of this disease. Uh, for most of the patients, even with malignancy, we're doing our very best. Um, while not treating them, we want to treat them, but we want to push them off as long as we can within the realm of safety to allow this peak to fall off. Um, I think you bring in a patient who already has a problem, whether that's cancer or uncontrollable diabetes, the minute that they come into a hospital or a doctor's office, they've raised their risk of contracting the disease 10, 15, 20 fold, maybe even more. And so the, the using telemedicine is a great way um, to, to keep an eye on your medical condition. Uh, and for the cancer patients who, who I treat pretty regularly, we're doing our best to, to take care of the ones that absolutely need treatment today in a safe, what we call COVID-free environment, where we test the patient beforehand, um, we know that the area is clean, uh, and we know that the risk of transmission to the patient is low. And we're trying to hold off some of the, the, the patients that can afford to hold off for as long as we can just to keep them safe. Yeah, so so there, you know, there's there's a bunch of, of anxieties about this, right? That this this virus is everywhere, and, and we talked about this. It's in your community. It is in a way everywhere, and so for healthcare providers, um, or for some people that are out and about, uh, which should be rare, but but if you're out at the grocery store, and we'll talk about that in a moment, healthcare providers, you know, what 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 a lot of us do is I use a set of scrubs to travel to and from work. Those are travel scrubs. Um, when I get to work, I take them off and I put on a set of work scrubs. And those work scrubs I work in, and when I'm done, I take them off and I have them washed. I put on my travel scrubs and I use those to go back and forth. Each time I change my scrubs, I wash my hands. I keep my hands off my face and I wash my hands because if I'm taking off dirty scrubs, they may very well have infection on them. Uh, when I get home, my wife has a, a, a wonderful approach to uh, kind of a ritual where I undress in the garage, take off the socks, the shoes, down to the very basics, and I place all those scrubs into a bag that I can throw into the washing machine and wash. And I go up, uh, because I'm in healthcare, and take a shower. Now, do you have to do all that? Maybe not to that extent, but why not? It's an easy thing to do. And it gives me a sense, again, of empowerment. I don't feel as anxious about getting the disease because between hand washing and keeping my clothes separated and washed, I feel a little bit more in control and I, that decreases the anxiety significantly. One of the big questions that comes up is real life questions like, can I get food delivered? Uh, can I go to the grocery store? Um, and the reality is, is if you, if you stay to the rules that we talked about, hand washing and hands below the, the shoulders, you're gonna be fine. Um, food that's delivered to the door, take it out of the bag that it came in, discard that bag, wash your hands, uh, and pour the food out. Um, after you poured the food out, may have come in a carton, wash your hands again. Same thing, you go to the grocery store, you go to the, to the pharmacy to pick something up. It's okay to push the cart. You're gonna be pulling things off the shelf. Just keep your hands away from your face, and when you're done, wash your hands. If you follow those rules, which are critical rules here, you're, you're not going to get infected. You have control, um, and as a result, you're empowered. You feel less anxious, and you realize that this is no different than any other virus or any other bacteria, but following those, those basic rules and sticking with them uh, is going to make for a much safer environment for you and for your family.